if you're going to trade this strategy, if you get wicked out in its news, you 100% have to get the same amount of size, right? Because your 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 thesis is that this news is impactful and it's going to make a, a significant percentage move, right? So you have to make sure you're making up for the losses and then and then paying yourself. You know what I'm going to say to you is is just look at, wait for the base, wait wait for that one green candle at 260. Um, a pause can hammer candle and you get an inside pause candle and then you can kind of get involved in that 250 risking 260 area goes down into a halt risk down and then you get a halt and reopen lower right like it was just a really good opportunity and when i way i could consider this probably the best one of the month is just uh, on the risk perspective that you didn't really have to risk that much i think that what that what makes that trade really great what is up guys, Alex here and welcome to episode 6 of the Axis Investors Podcast. In this week's episode, we're going to be talking about trading out of a drawdown, how to improve your entry and exit, and also what was the best opportunity of the week. Before getting into the show, a quick reminder that all the best tools for day trading and investing will be linked down in the description. That includes brokers, scanner, charts, and newsfeed. And also, we have something new. The show is now available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts if you want to listen to the audio version of this show. So without further ado, let's get right in. Yeah, we could start that house trading this month. Yeah, okay. Um, for me, so far, it's been it's been kind of slow. Uh, I haven't really been able to catch, um, you know, some big moves or any of the big moves that ha have happened. Um you know, and that's part of the game. Sometimes you don't see things uh, really clearly and or sometimes your your setup's not there and it's best to just make sure that you, um, you know, don't get FOMO and, and start taking trades that are outside of your playbook or, or, or comfort zone. And, um, you know, one of the questions that we have later is, uh, you know, about drawdowns. So, you know, we can talk about that and, and making sure, you know, I'm essentially trying to keep myself out of that. Um, so I haven't made much progress this month, you know, the first couple of days this month, um, you know, but it's a long month and I'm okay with that. And, you know, I know that I just need to keep, uh, you know, coming to work every day, sitting down, grinding and, and waiting for my pitch. Yeah, um, I'm kind of the opposite. I've seen a lot of good setup when it came to news, but I haven't been able to really capture them. And it's been creating a, bu a bunch of FOMO and I, I kind of FOMO into a bunch of trades today. Um, I don't think they're really worth going over because there's like there's just no context they're just like random clicking on on trades and this is where i can get myself into a drawdown if i don't catch myself early and i didn't think it would be the case because i've been really since your last conversation i've been pretty good with my discipline outside of trading like i got back i signed up at the gym i started to train again and I did everything. I'm eating well, respecting whenever I'm supposed to sleep, whenever I'm supposed to wake up. Like everything is online about where I should see success in my trading, but it's it's not showing up yet. So I feel a bit, I guess, frustrated that it's not paying off right away, even if it's only been like a week. But, you know, that's just life. And we're going to cover that later in a, a few topics that we have to talk about. So so far, like you said, market has been a bit slow for you. Did you want it to cover some parts that, that you realized or how how did you came about that conclusion? A lot. I just, you know, for me, it just, I, you know, I, so I engage in, in both day and swing trading and, you know, in, in terms of a swing trading, the market's just been grinding up um, and going higher and higher. And I'm kind of just holding the positions that I have and I don't really see many new um, like bases. Uh, you know, even the, the, the mini pullback that we had in, in the queues, right? It, it's basically, you know, um, so I'm just looking off at the chart. It looks, it's, you know, basically a half a day in the afternoon, you sell off for a day and then you start rallying. Um, but it's not really enough to really, you know, shake the tree and, and really form some bases. And as I go through the watch list that I have for my um, swing trades, there's not, not much there. Um, and with respect to my day trading, you know, I like, I prefer to trade, I prefer to trade larger cap names, um, that have gaps or R vol relative volume, um, to try to catch continuation moves in those. 
Um, and now that earnings season is kind of winding down, uh, we're seeing some more of those small caps make moves. And it's just not my, they're just not my A plus setups. I know that they're there and there's opportunities there. Um, you know, and I've been obviously playbooking and, and, and keeping an eye on what's been moving. Um, so I know that those, that's where the bigger movers are, are, are lately. Um, so I need to, I need to adapt and adjust a little bit and, and, you know, change my focus up just a little bit there. Yeah, I think that this is exactly where I'm starting to have FOMO. It's um, all these small caps that are running. They're not necessarily my my A plus also, but I know I can make money in them. But I'm trying to kind of stay away because it's it's very um, it gets me into over trading because there's so many running at the same time. So it's it's a bit harder for me to have like a very um, direct focus on my edge or, or what I want to achieve, and I'm kind of spreading myself pretty thin. Uh, across the board. So this is where um, I'm starting to sometimes, you know, just just cross the line about over trading and trading my playbook. And we, we spoke about uh, a few setups this week because I sent you some ideas that I had and your first response was just, yeah, these are just way too extended. And these were NVIDIA. Uh, I think there was even SMCI. And there was a couple other names that I forgot the, the exact name, but they were just not out of a base. And could you describe what do you think about like a good, I guess, swing long setup would be like? Sorry for the interruption, but if you have any question or topic that you'd like us to cover, let us know in the comment section. And while you're at it, like and subscribe. Let's get back to the show. <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, I'm a believer that the market's uh, fractal, right? And, and by that, I mean, um, whatever... Whatever, whenever you see a base or whatever I consider a base, whether it's one to 20 candles, you know, just to keep it arbitrary, um, not one, I don't, you know, two to 20 candles, right? Of it's going to be price contraction, volatility contraction, uh, where things get tighter. And you can see that on a one minute chart, a two minute chart, three minute chart, you know, whatever your flavor is, you know, five, 15 and for me, for a swing trade, I'm going to look for that on a 60 minute and a daily chart. Um, I, I will incorporate the weekly chart just so I'm, I'm aware. Um, but my swing trades tend to be, um, you know, just an, just even an, an overnight if that's the, if that if I get the move that I'm looking for, um, you know, to two weeks. So, you know, I'm not as concerned. Well, you know, I am concerned with the weekend, but I'm, I'm not going to make it as I'm not going to be as con concerned because I'm I'm looking for that kind of a momentum burst or move out of out of like a consolidation. And you know, with respect to your idea of Nvidia, you know, <clears throat> you were looking for kind of like a breakout continuation move. Um, and for me, what you can get a nice day trade on, on from that, right? Because it's it's still today. There's some great momentum. Um, you know, there was a nice little flag around 9, 10, and you get a 10, $15 move out of that. Um, but in terms of like a swing trade, it's just, you know, at some point you have to start playing the probabilities and what, how far, how far away is it from its moving averages on, on the daily time frames, And, you know, the, the, the higher and higher and higher it goes, it's going to be like that rubber band stretched the opposite way for a possible short, like, S, like what we saw at SMCI a couple, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Mm. Yeah. So you think, I mean, it's hard to to really know the probability of like this going down, just staying like staying choppy, ranging and going higher, really because we don't know. It all depends if there's news and if there's no news, right? We we don't know. It's gonna probably just track the market and you know follow what whatever the semis are doing. And so, would you consider an X amount of time for a swing trade that you want to hold over like multiple weeks? Like, I mean, in terms of a base. Like, I mean, a lot of people talk about, you know, like, uh, like a three months or one month or six month. Like, is there a, a specific thing that you're looking for? Or it could be a shorter base if it's something that has a lot of momentum. I mean, it, it could totally be a shorter base that has a lot of momentum. Um, you know, some of the best, you know, let's, let's, you know, again, just be fractal here. Right. So sometimes you see, um, really strong momentum bursts on like a five or a 15 minute chart off the open. Right. And then you see two to like seven minutes of sideways to downward consolidation action. 
and then you get that a continuation move higher, right? Um, something that I was looking at today was this, you know, that LYT and, you know, you get uh, up, you get a side, sideways pullback for four candles, you get up, consolidation for two candles, then you get up. Um, and for me on the day trade, that's exactly, you know, that's exactly the same thing that I, that I look for. Um, you know, I'm not here to give advice or, or you know, trade advice or in, in, you know, so by no means I, I'm not going to say I don't have a position, um, but something I'm looking at is Carvana, right? And everyone can have an opinion on that, uh, whatever, you know, whatever they want. But if you look at a daily chart, the volatility is starting to contract. It's moving averages are starting to catch up. Um, you know, so it, it looks interesting to me for a long. It's still extended from its 20, 21 EMA, which is the, the one of the moving averages that I look at. Um, you know, but as long if the market's continuing to grind higher, um, you know, I'm going to be looking for some kind of setup for whether it's a day trade or a swing trade. Um, my bias is is definitely to the long side there. And when we're talking about the whole market like this and i mean this year has been since end of last year it's been it's been a pretty good rally when everybody was talking about like you know a bear market case so it was a big shift of momentum and do you think if the market stays strong like this do you really focus more on swings or you still prefer to kind of mix the day trades with the, the swing trades yeah so that was something that i i, I had to i had to adjust and, and, you know, and that's kind of like what you asked before, you know, what, you know, that, that's like me seeing, not seeing my day trades really play out. You know, the ones I've been in have kind of been like a single here or a single there, or, you know, a one hour loss. So I'm not, if I'm not making progress there, but I see that things are trending higher, kind of trending and, and just grinding higher, then you know, that's a market where you want to be long and you want to take risk home overnight, you know, because the, it seems like the probabilities and the grind and the march higher continues, right? Um, you know, and, and in this low, lower volatility market, um, you know, there's definitely some great opportunities in, in swing longs, in my opinion. Yeah. So that, that means, uh, pretty much if things are going higher, but not necessarily in terms of like crazy volatility, because there's a big difference when we're, we're not range bonding, but you know, we're going higher on the daily chart, but there's no like crazy CPI catalyst coming in. There's no like panic. There's nothing really that just want to, that's going to get you to have this extra range in the day. It's really just more over time that you're getting paid off. So do you think that this is the best time to be a swing trader? The, the, the swing traders that I interact with, you know, they're even finding it difficult to, they're, they're finding it difficult to find new ideas or entries, right? Because they're, most of them think similarly to I, myself where they're looking for a base to enter and things, most things are just extended. Um, so they're kind of just riding the positions that they, that they have, um, you know, so it, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, I, I think that this is a very interesting dynamic of a market because there's been so much strength in these semi, in the semi names. Um, and you're seeing this big dike decoupling from, I don't want to, you know, stray too far, but you're seeing a big decoupling of the magnificent seven, right? Like where Apple and Tesla and Google are all very weak and, you know, Nvidia meta and Amazon are pretty strong. But it, you know, again, it doesn't mean you can't find trades. You can, you can definitely find day trades. Like you said, you know, you can find news. There's, there are opportunities, but I think it's just, it, we're in a market where you have to be very selective and aware of what's being, of the dynamic that's being played out. Yeah, totally, totally makes sense. All right. So I wanted to cover a trade I took um, yesterday, which was on NYCB which was a bank name and this stock was, um, it was fresh news. It was a breaking news trade and it was a trade. I, I traded well, but then got caught up in some unfortunate situation that I couldn't really know in advance because it was just uh, news that came out while it was halted. So I'll be breaking it down 
um, maybe wanted to your, your thoughts and opinion on it. And after that, I really wanted to cover what, what I thought was the best opportunity probably of the week or week or past week, even probably the month so far. And it was again on SMCI, but it wasn't really the trade that everybody talked about. So we'll go over that right after. Sounds good. All right. So the trade is going to be on NYCB. And as we can see on this chart, um, we had a really big move from the three to the 160 and after that it was halted so on that specific trade it was a trade that was really in my playbook and i thought it was a really good opportunity because even if it's not really a, a breaking news trader that you are um, this news was pretty popular so it was easy to find the news within the first minute or two minutes you didn't need to have bloomberg um, a lot of people reposted that news so it was really easy to participate and this is, as you can see over here, it's a bank stock. And last year, what we saw on, it was WAL, FRC, PACW, so many of the bank names. So on the daily chart, we can see that it's a bank that just not doing well. It was gapping down on earnings at first, and then it was just keeping on selling off because this, uh, this one is a regional and it was lacking liquidity. So people thought this could go bankrupt which was the exact same story as we saw um, on all the original last year. I think it was exactly the same time of year. So it might be a thing that in February or actually March right now, <laughs> the banks are just not doing well. So there was even some more news today with uh, the Fed and all that stuff. So, so for this trade, um, I had it already on watch for a couple weeks, um, I was just waiting for some kind of news to come out either on the positive side or negative. And on that specific day, which was uh, Wednesday, the 6th of March, there was exactly what I wanted. And there was some news and it was the same, same news as what we saw on FRC and also PACW, if ever you guys want to go check it out for last year. And so when I saw that news, what I did, and I'll, I'll show the execution on screen and if you're not able to see this because you're watching or listening to the audio version uh, the reference price is the price that the news started at or the price before the news hit it was 315 and i was able to get an average price of about three dollars and on the one minute chart we had like a quick wick and i decided to stop out before a cross reference and this is where the first issue came in because after that, when we slammed back down, um, the trade really worked out well and I got paid off pretty much for like, um, I would say almost a 50% move within a matter of probably 10 minutes, which was really, really good before something unfortunate happened. So I wanted to have your, your, um, your thoughts on my execution on this and where I thought the big problem was is on this news trade, I have a really hard time risking the reference price because it, sometimes it feels like it's far away or it feels like if it crossed that price, I'm going to get like a bigger loss than I wanted. And you have more experience than me trading breaking news. You've been around a lot of traders that trades news. And could you maybe more describe how would be a proper execution or the issue that you see with that trade? Yeah. Um... <clears throat> you know, as, as you know, we've spoken about, you know, I don't, I don't love trading these one minute fast movers anymore, just because, you know, I can envision exactly what happened to you, right? Um, you're entering on that first candle because you see the news, the headline, um, you know, liquidity issues, whatever it was. Um, and then the next candle, whether it's um, an, an HFT or some kind of hedge fund, Right. They flash the bid. They buy some stock. Um, right. And, and, you know, this is this is a reference from billions, right, where they, they you buy some stock up and then you slam the bid. Right. Because if 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 this stock was in that SSR mode, um, you know, you have to short on an uptick. So, you know, they buy 50,000 shares or 100,000 shares only to sell 300,000 shares. Right. And then the whole candle is you know, almost 800,000 shares. Um, and, it, and it's so hard in the moment because you're trying to watch the level two and you don't know exactly if, it, if that 315 is going to hold or fail or, or what's going to happen. 
um, you know, I think this is just going to be for you since break, trading breaking news is, is a newer venture. It's just going to come with <clears throat> seeing more and more of these plays happen, um, seeing more and more and being involved with them more and more. Um, seeing that, you know, if, because if, if, if you're right, you know, if you're right, it's going to, it's going to really work out. And if you're wrong, if you're wrong, like, and even if you have to cover 320s or 325s, because that reference broke it because you, you gave it that extra second just to see um, the times that you make this 50% is, is going to completely offset that, right? It offset those, you know, fewer moments in time when it does reference because for whatever reason, the news wasn't received or interpreted the way that you thought it was going to be. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's really interesting because you can almost allow yourself to give just a bit more wiggle room because if you're right, it's going to, like you said, it's going to cover like the losses times five, six. So it's not a, an issue. And I guess I have to be, maybe it's a problem of me and not just trading breaking news, but sometimes there's really, there's a headlines that like they have like a strong initial move and then they just re reverse this or just, come right back to reference um, to where before the news happened. And it, sometimes the news is impactful. Sometimes maybe it's not. Have you seen not a tendency, but a way that you can really narrow down your selection to find the one that have more chance of um, making a bigger move? Because I did hit a bunch of... Uh, a bunch of news which have an initial, an initial move. So it's not just random news. It's news that do move the market at first, but then kind of comes back right away to, to reference price. So do you think it's maybe I'm, I'm trading too wide of a news spectrum and I should narrow it down? Or you think there's, it's kind of also just how the game is played? Um, I, th I mean, I think, I, think, I think that it's a little bit of both of those things. Um, both of those things that you just mentioned. I think that one, you know, being around people that trade news or, or and, and, and looking at PR headlines all the time, you know, I, I, and that was part of my problem with trying to trade breaking news. I never knew which one, which, which one is the one that is really going to make a stock move. Or, you know, sometimes I've seen articles passed around that weren't on Bloomberg that weren't ri widely distributed. And, you know, I get involved and nothing's happening. And, I, and I'm like, well, you know, and I don't want to just be stuck with this position and I'll get out. And then someone else on Twitter happens to post it or tweet it. And, and then, then the move happens, right? So I was almost too early. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know, I think that you, you just need to have like a good three to six month news cycle to really see what's moving stocks. What do people care about? What type of headlines, right? Things like AI or things are partnerships from um, like large cap to small cap partnerships, um, you know, drug news, like those are things that are always going to move the markets. And then it's these other headlines um, that, you know, as you start seeing them and, and playing them, you'll realize that 90% of them are probably not market moving events, right? Um, you know, case in point yesterday or the other day before, I think you asked me about a Microsoft headline, you know, and there was a small move, but it was just, it just wasn't really impactful. Right. Um, and, you know, really think, you know, really defining your playbook on, on your news trades and, and kind of looking to see what, what headlines are, are moving stocks um, and how they're really moving. And, and you'll kind of get that feel for it and you'll get a good feel for which, which headlines, are the ones that you want to try to focus and find. Yeah. So for, for the press release, I got, I got really good to compare, uh, to compare myself to where I started because I realized even this week and this past past week, I mean, for all the headlines that come, come out in the morning, I only got involved in once, once talk, I think yesterday and yesterday in the after hour and 
also one stock i think the day before that and it ended up being the one that did have like the biggest biggest move so like i kind of now i see so many press releases because that's i just read them every morning from like 6 a.m to pretty much the open so i know which one within like three words are going to be the one that like have not necessarily are going to be the one that moved the stock but the one that like actually are not going to move the stock so it's very easy to filter within like a, a quick glance and my reading is actually getting so much faster um just at like because they're always structured the same way so you you kind of glimpse through them like in a very fast way compared to when I started uh, that specific strategy um, a little while back. So that was that was, So there's progress in that sense that I'm not getting involved in many uh, pre-market stock versus before I used to trade sometimes five or six on press release. Still managed to hit the good one, but it was just um, when I was looking at my everything I traded on that day just was way too many shares and way too many tickers, which are now getting um really fleshed out but where i still struggle is more on the intraday news the one that are kind of the not expected or not coming from that company specific so hit piece um articles and so on and so forth these are the one that are i guess they're the most impactful because nobody saw it coming but at the same time um they're they're pretty hard to play because it goes very quickly and it happened to me a few times that I was just too early on the news. And that's the worst part because you get involved, you get out, you look at the stock two minutes later and it's down 40% and you're like, oh, like I was just too early. Yeah. Well, so this is, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. So, you know, maybe you just need a little tweaking of your entry tactic, tactics, right? Like, you know, we've, we've had offline discussions about, you know, needing to trade the breaking news. Right. But, you know, there are things you can do even for this NYCB trade where, you know, obviously, you know, the putting yourself in the biggest amount of strength is getting your max position size before three, you know, and and then just before you even know it, just putting a hard stop in at 320. Right. You know, for example. Right. Or it's like, mm -hmm. all right, I know that my stops at 320. Right whatever I'm risking, because I, you know, it, it was so fast, that's what I'm risking. <clears throat> um, you know, that, that, you know, things like that, right, where you're not relying on your speed of watching the level two or the flickers, right, of those prints, because, because of the, of that little, you know, wick. Some of the things you can do are, are, if news is real, right, if news is real, and it's very important, you wait until you wait until the stock is almost or, or approaching that limit up or limit down spot. And then you get involved. You get your, you get yourself involved into that halt at that spot. You're, you're at a little bit of a position of weakness, just in my opinion, just because you're entering further away from the reference points. But in my opinion, you're also giving yourself a higher probability of follow through when the stock reopens. Right? So, you know, you can kind of figure out where the limit, the reference point is and where the, or where the stock was going to halt in this point, in this case, it looks like it's two, not say 290 ish at that, that first halt, you know, and you can just, you might not be able to get in that, you know, that's one of the risks. Um, but at least then you can kind of gauge and see and give yourself that, that moment in time to think about the trade and the setup. Right. Um, some other things you can do are, watch where the stock's indicating, right? In this case, it almost indicated the same exact closing price. So if you don't want to hold through the halt, you can try to get yourself involved in that opening print and 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 shorting that opening print um, and getting, you know, and and watching the stock go down then. You know, and every every stock's gonna be different because as you can see, as as time goes on, you know, the halts and the, and the reopenings become bigger and bigger, but really close to that news, um, you know, it, it could be a good opportunity, it could be a good, um, lesson or something for you to think about in terms of entering. Right. And, you know, you know, what I'm going to say to you is, is just look at, wait for the base, wait, wait for that one green candle at 260, um, a pause can hammer candle and you get an inside pause candle, and then you can kind of get involved in that 250 
risking 260 area goes down into a halt, risk down, and then you get a halt and reopen lower, right? Um, so you don't have to be involved in that breaking news. So, so just little little nuances that you can think about um, to maybe incorporate into like your, you know how you're trading these breaking news things. Yeah. So, yeah, that covers really really well what I was was thinking because a lot of these trades I get involved, but I take too much of a big loss on the first exit, which is like normally when it wicks back up. And then whatever I make back, I still make it back. But then it just sometimes I don't really hit it with the same size because I'm a little scared that I take the second loss. So then I just make it back and, you know, make a bit more. So there's definitely some. I figured out how which news, how to get involved and all that. But there's more re refining of the strategy, which I think it's probably incomplete at this point. Yeah, I think and that because oh, no, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, the one thing I'm going to say real quick, though, is if you're going to trade the strategy, if you get wicked out and it's news, you 100% have to get the same amount of size, right? Because your 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 thesis is that this news is impactful and it's going to make a, a significant percentage move, right? So you have to make sure you're making up for the losses and then and then paying yourself. Sorry. Yeah, no, that, that's that's exactly it. Is um, some trade management that's just incomplete and. I don't have my if then statement built in like, okay, if I get in and it end up recrossing re reference price and I stop out, well, if we get back, you know, to that low of, of that candle, or let's, for example, uh, you know, reference price, it's 310. We cross back to 315 and then we re slam back, you know, because it's negative news, maybe a little imbalance, a lot of people panicking creates a weird first minute price action. But when we recross that price where I think it's negative news and we're going back down, then I need to really hit it as again. I don't have my, that's that's where it gets probably incomplete. And as we talk about it, that's where I realized that for my other strategy or other way of trading, I do have these kind of variable of like, okay, if I'm buying a breakout, you know, if I'm buying that breakout and I see it stall and it flushes back, I'll get out on the flush. But then if we recross that breakout spot, I'll just get back in because it was probably a shakeout. Like, for example, stuff like that. Yeah. So this is where it gets a little weird. So, you know, before moving out of that trade, um, this trade was good until um, it wasn't. So um, on the last uh, halt up over here, when it started to, when it was just getting halted up, I tried to get out of that trade and I didn't, I didn't, and it got ha halted for news, which was um, something that you can't really predict. And I think this is going to be a good spot to, to talk about a question that we got from one of your friend and somebody I know a little, and it was about tra um, how to trade out of a drawdown. And also I thought it would, it would be good to add, um, what makes people or trader go into drawdown, like different scenario that are pretty common and you know, how to maybe not get yourself in that position and what's the best practice uh, to get out of it. So you want to start with the, with the question that we got? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, what, what do you do when you get into a drawdown? Um, you know, and everyone, every person is going to be different. Everyone thinks differently, uh, but there's, to me, there's two types of drawdowns. There's a drawdown like this event or something like ZJYL that happened in December where it closed at 11 and opened up at 100. That's the black swan drawdown. Um, and I'm not talking, um, you know, even if you're not, even if you get stuck in a halt like this and it's not just you fading a parabolic small cap. If, if you are a solid trader with a sound process, you know, and you get stuck at that black swan event, you know, as devastating it is financially, you have to remember or hope, you know, I hope that you prior to that black swan event are, are trading in a, in a, in a solid, with a solid mentality um, and you're profitable, you know, you just, you have to somehow tell yourself and remind yourself that that's just that one off. Um, and unfortunately you have to grind away to, to get back, get yourself back to that pre black swan event, you know, watermark. 
Um, and I would say that the way to work out, the, the other drawdown is your strategy is just, just not there. Um, like mine is right now. Like for me, what I want to see and like how I want to trade things, I just haven't been hitting it. And I've taken some one-hour losses, but I know that for me in, in this moment of time, um, it's really important to not start just searching for trades, searching for the next holy grail, searching for just to be active. You know, just because you're not making money doesn't mean you have to be recklessly risking money, right? And I think a lot of people get into the, a drawdown that way. Um, and if you're getting into a drawdown that way, you know, you have to be just be self-aware and, and see that your strategies are just aren't working and you have to slow down. So you either need to decrease the frequency of your trading um, or decrease the um, risk per trade that you're putting on um, until you kind of are seeing things better, right? Um, I don't believe in just completely stopping your trading. Um, I think that you want to continue to engage. Um, you know, it, it, I, I'm a proponent of taking breaks. So maybe you need to take a day off. Maybe you take, need to take a week off and, and kind of just get your head away from the markets. And, you know, and when you come back, you start trading small. You know, it, I think that too many people have too big of an ego where they can't just go back to, you know, risking $50 a trade or $10 a trade, whatever your, whatever something where it's insignificant enough to you that you can kind of really see things, try to see things clearly, right? Because it's not about the P&L, it's about the process and about getting your confidence back. And then, you know, once, you know, and those things can, can come back quickly and, the, you know, the type of market we're in are, are going to obviously make a difference in, in, in terms of the speed and velocity of that happening. Um, but there's no reason why you can't risk a hundred dollars a trade or whatever, you know, something small again for a whole week, just to prove to yourself that I still know how to trade. You know, it just, for whatever reason, I need to slow it down or I'm being, I have too much FOMO because too many things are going on or, or, and I'm, and I'm chasing or, or whatever the cause of your drawdown is, um, really stepping back and just reflecting and being self-aware. I think is, is the first most important thing that, that, that someone can do. So if we, if we have to put it by step, so how to trade out of a drawdown, how, what it would be step one, it's probably take the, I, I think if I had to, to guess, or for me, what I'm drawdowns for me happen very quickly. Um, just to take an example, um, I'll take one bigger loss than I want it, not necessarily like really big, just like um, an annoying loss. And the next day I'm already trying to make back that loss. So then like I oversize, I trade just a bit bigger and then I get probably locked out on the second day because that's just exactly how it goes every time. So after that, you're locked out. You're like, all right, so I'm going to trade small. You trade small for a day or two, try to get back in your groove and you really go back quickly to like the same size as you were before. But it feels like maybe you got yourself in a, in a drawdown, like you mentioned, because the market is not, it's just not really there for your strategy. And everything is so cyclical in the market that when you make money or when the market aligns with your view, it's, it's almost hard to lose money. Because like everything just, just works, but it's so quick to not realize that. So for me, it, the, the step one always been to take like a break of the market. And it's, it's so hard because you, it's not asking a trader to not be in front of the market. Like on a day, it's like the ultimate FOMO in the, like uh, indicator. <laughs> it's so hard. You just, no matter what you're going to do on that day, the only thing that you're going to think about is about, am I missing something? Then you go back at the end of the day and you're like, oh, my A plus setup was there on that day. This would have been a home run. So then you even have sometimes even more FOMO versus just like, even if you were there, you were probably not going to be in, a, in like a, a good place to take it. So me, it always been take like at least a day off and sometimes even two, it's, it's, so I'll example, I'll start like I'll take a Friday and maybe like a, a Monday or something like that. So it's like, a, it's very, it's like a good break. And also there's two days that the market is actually closed. So it gives me like, I come back like after a week and I'm like really 
at peace with myself versus already thinking about the day before. Um, do you have like a, a different um, aspect or way that you you go about it? No, I mean, I I, <clears throat> I think that I think that what you said is 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 great. It's great for you, right? Every you know, every 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 person's different. Every person's in a different situation um, and different place in their life in their lives. Um, you know, some people might be able to, you know, I think that being self-aware is very important. And, and some people might be able to just take a, a walk at noon and really clear their mind, become peace with what they've, what, what's happened and, and get themselves back on track. And, and some people might really need to, um, take more time off. Like, you know, like, like you said, and some people, some people might need to take a week off, you know, I think the biggest thing that you just admitted, right, you know, which is hard to do or, and is just that you're focusing on the money, right? You're not focusing on your process, your trading process, right? And focusing on your trading process, the results will come, right? And as long as, you know, and, and, and for me, when, I, when I've been in drawdowns, I just, sometimes I just go back and look at my results. I go back and look at my trading and I, re, I just remind myself that, over however many years I've been doing this now, I've been profitable, right? Some some more so than others, but just like how the stock market over the long run has gone up, my trading over the long run has been profitable, right? So you have to, you know, as, as, discouraged, as discouraged as you may be about the financial, the monetary, the result, Right. That's not what this is about. Right. This is about good, sound trading where you're putting yourself in high probability situations with positive expected value, positive risk reward, like a good risk reward, whatever that means to you, whether it's trading one minute news charts or, you know, slow 15 minute setups like myself. It, you know, getting back to your bread and butter and your basics and just remember reminding yourself that. You're, if you're in this for the marathon, then then the next day doesn't matter, right? Because even if that even if your A plus setup was there, and and you know, even if you risked even if you risked three R on that trade just because you were still on emotional tilt from the days before, like, and and you know, so then you get a fifteen R winner. It, it, is that is that life changing to you? Like, probably not, right? I mean, maybe it is. Maybe, maybe you take such a crazy shot that you put your whole account in on, you know, LYT this morning and it goes from two to 18, like and maybe that, maybe, right? But people are always looking this at, at, that, at that in hindsight, right? And that's not, that's not, the, that's the exception. That's not the norm, right? Where, where it looks so easy to just go all in, you know, risking, you know, it was so obvious, right? But in the moment, in the moment, you probably weren't thinking that, right? Otherwise you would have done it, right? That's what I, and that's something that I've been telling you and some other friends, you know, you can't think like that, that that was the spot to get out of your hole in that one trade just because you saw that happen, right? You weren't in the right mindset. Otherwise you would have done it, you know, and, and don't get me wrong. I do it too. You know, I, you know, we're going to talk about the SMCI trade. It's like, man, what if I just was at my desk and 515 on a Friday, like, and I just boom, wailed it in. You know, all in, but, you know, great. I would have been having a, you know, instead of having a mediocre, slow start to the year, I would have, hit, you know, all those emotions and of underperformance and not doing well to start the year are just gone, right? Out of, because of one trade. But, you know, that's, that's, that's not the case, you know, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that. I've made peace with it. And, and re recognizing that is the most important thing that you can do. So what would you say step two is if we say maybe take a, a bit of a time off is going to be relative to the person. As we said, some people hold a grudge against the market or against themselves for way longer, like probably I am. But then step two would be, would you go back to stats? Like, I I think it would be probably good good to go to stats as a second, see where, you, where you're really crushing it or where things are, are doing well and where things are, are the opposite. Yeah, one hundred percent. You know, I you know, I, I hope I hope that all traders who watch this record um, all of their trades somewhere, whether it's Trader View or TradeZilla or 
you know, some of the other products that, you know, your own spreadsheet that are out there basically. Um, because you want to know what trades are doing well at that time, right? Are, is it your one minute setups? Is it your five minute setups? Is it your 15 minute setups? Is it your, is it your pullback trades? Is it your flag trades? Is it your breakout trades? Um, and there's always a pattern, right? Is it, is it, is it the trades that you're making from 11 to 11, 11 to one? Is it the trades you're making 11 to four, right? Are you only making money? You know, I found a pattern like for a long period of time where I wasn't making money from nine 30 to 10, but every morning I was coming in and I was trading and every, you know, 75% of my mornings I was down. Right. And so I just, I cut it out and it helped me work out of that drawdown that I'd put myself in or that stagnant state. Right. So looking at your stats and, and, and just something as simple as eliminating the trades that you realize aren't working for a period of time. And maybe that naturally slows you down a little bit and naturally forces you to only look for one setup that you know is working well right now. Um, you know, and, and it can help you build out, work out of the drawdown. Yeah, for me, for me, when I looked at my stats, I haven't done it recently. It's definitely a good thing that I, it's definitely a thing I should be doing and I will be doing. Um, me was really the afternoon trading. Um, I always had such a hard time finding a playbook for that because I always traded the, before going full, full time, probably four years ago, or whatever, whenever it was. I was always being able to to trade like the pre-market, which I wasn't trading that, that much, but at least the first like two hours of the day or three hours until noon, pretty much. So I built a playbook or I got used to how fast the stock moved during that time. So I've, I built a, what I would call an edge during that like high high momentum time of day, but I never understood when things are just slowing down. So I was always like, whenever I transitioned to trading full-time, I was still making money in the morning, but I would just always give back like 30% or half. And it was just really, really frustrating. And I never really found that much of a playbook ex except when it was like some of these like crazy, crazy stock that like, you know, like, like the really outlier stock that I'm like, oh, these are probably still worth watching the afternoon because something could happen on, on them. But for your average day, it was always just staying around and then, you know, punting a bit here, punting a bit there. And then oh, I should have never took those straight. Now I'm frustrated going the next day. So it was, it was always, um, this was really like, or it still is if I stay around and trade random stuff at the afternoon with the, uh, decision fatigue is just something that I, I kind of always punt a bit of cash. And when you look at the end of the month, it's, it's a lot, you know, it's, a, it's probably like sometimes 30% of your month <laughs> that that's gone right there. Yeah. Um, you know, that, and that's key. So, I mean, those are, if th those are the patterns that you know and recognize about your trading, you need to implement rules, right? Like I'm, my give back budget is always 10, maybe it's 10% because you think that there might be a trade there, or maybe, Maybe your stats are a lot worse than you think they are, and you just need to cut out all of your trading. Um, for me, you know, if I'm here, I'll, I'll continue to watch. Um, but as the day goes on, I, I want to make sure that I'm only involved in the, in the bigger trend. So a rule that I implemented was that I only watch 15 minute candles after lunchtime. Um, you know, that's the shortest time frame I'll watch. I'll watch 15s, 30s and, and 60s basically. And, you know, I can really see or look for, you know, as I look around on my screens, I can really see, is there anything really worth trading, right? So many times when you're still looking at those smaller timeframes, people, you know, people, like the brain's naturally looking for patterns, right? The brain naturally looks for patterns. So you're, you're going to naturally look for something that might not be there, right? And, and, and get yourself involved in things that, might not actually be, you know, significant, right? On on the larger on the larger time frame or the larger, you know, the larger scale of things. Yeah. So if we like, so take a bit of time off after we would say, look at really really deep down on your stats, and after 
would you say size down? That would be probably the, the continuation until you at least have some kind of like probably probably for like almost like a, a month just to like really build like mental momentum or mon- mental confidence. Would you think that would be a stretch or a couple of weeks? I think, it, it, you know, again, it goes, it, that's, it's still trader dependent, right? Everyone's going to be a little different. Some, you know, and everyone's interpretation of what a drawdown is, is going to be different, right? Um, you know, it's funny that you mentioned just, you know, two negative days. So two negative days of, you know, is that really a drawdown or, I mean, yeah, you've had two negative days or, you know, a drawdown, I would say like maybe you had a, a month or two or three months of, of negative trading, you know, then you have really have to take a hard self look. Right. And, and maybe your, your, your steps, your recovery steps are going to be a little bit slower and more pronounced. Um, you know, but if you had three or four or five a week or two weeks of, of bad trading, you know, maybe you are, you trade small for a week and get that confidence back and then you go back to normal. Right. Whereas if you've had three, four five months of slow or poor trading, you know, maybe you do it for a whole month just to prove to yourself that I can trade small and have a positive month and, you know, without taking a, a big outsized loss, you know, wh- whatever it is that you were really struggling with. Right. Um, and really work through those bad habits so that, you know, as you come out of this and you slowly increase your size again, you know, you're creating new good habits for yourself. Yeah. Uh, when I, when I said a couple of days, it's, it's how it starts, not to where it, where it is. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> and, uh, would you think, would you think that cutting off, uh, cutting off Twitter would be a good thing? Probably or it's like social media. No, totally. I feel like it, it generates a lot of FOMO um, for me. To- uh, totally. Even when I'm trading well, I just, I don't know. It's so, it's so odd that like, I'm like, I'm not like, I, I think I'm a decent trader. I'm not the greatest, but like, as soon as I compare it to myself, to everybody on, on Twitter, it's like, I feel like almost sh- ashamed of my trading. <laughs> like I thought I had a good day. Yeah. I have a great day. Like, you know, everything when I traded well, I made some, you know, like, good amount of money compared to, I guess, the average citizen. And then you go on Twitter and you look like a, a total loser and you're like, wow, I'm the bottom tier of all the internet trader. Like, and it's so, and then the next day you're like, oh man, like you're, you're instantly not satisfied about your trading. And like, whenever I'm trading even worse, it's like you have a, a grudge uh, against these people sometimes. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother podcast you know, episode or converse topic of conversation for us to have, like there's, there's so many different things you just touched on, right? Like your, you know, your self-worth, your view of yourself, um, like the ego, um, all these things that are controlling it and controlling our daily, um, actions basically. And, you know, all things that I am still working on to this day. Right. And I think a lot of people are working on, you know, and, I don't think a lot of people are, are self-aware of what you just said, like in the moment, right? Being self-aware that in the moment is key. And like, if you feel that, right? Like I have, you know, I, I have a little daily note that I read to myself of just 20 rules, like things that I'm trying to work on progressively. Right. And one of those things is that if I feel emotional because of something else, like I shouldn't trade or I should really cut back on my trading. I don't always follow it. <laughs> um, that's another, that's another issue. Right. But I, I try to be at least aware of it. Right. Whether it's, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I missed that trade yesterday. All right. Be aware of that. Make a mental note of it. The next morning, like when I read my little notes, all right, just because I missed X, Y, Z yesterday, if X, Y, Z or something similar sets up today, I just got to hit it. You know, like I don't have to take extra size or extra risk. Just make sure you hit it, you know, and take your piece of the pie because everything is, Every event's independent of each other. I, I can't control the results. I can just control my actions, right? Yeah, it, it totally makes sense. So um, I think it's pretty much complete um, that segment, which is really about trading out of a drawdown, which it's m- much more familiar than what people or what is the average trader think. I mean, I know so many guys that have been and like profitable guys that have been in, in drawdown for, for years not for years, but they have been example traded well for a few years. They made like a really good chunk of PNL and then they were just stuck for like a year straight 
and it, it's really hard to get out of one uh, when you're in like a deep hole it's it's definitely not um it's not fun and it's it's really really hard to uh to come back and and be really your full self as a trader yeah i mean so because it just weighs it weighs on you it weighs on you um you know because then you're just putting more pressure on your on yourself to perform right because this is a performance job and you're only getting paid when you're when you're making money right so it's just it's hard it you know and I, and I get it yeah so i wanted to uh so the next subject i wanted to talk about it was the best opportunity of the week and i thought it was um smci and we're not talking about the big um the big day that it flushed out um, like crazy and everybody made money shorting it, but it was kind of an opposite trade. It was on the long side and it was when they announced uh, the news that they were going to be um, being added to the S&P 500. So this one was a, a very interesting one because they announced it on Friday at 5.17 and We've seen another trade that was somewhat similar to that one, and it was um, on Amazon recently that they were getting um, added to the Dow Jones, I believe. That's what it was. And it's not a trade that I took many times. I think I took this trade, or not this specific one, but a similar trade a couple of times. But this one was like a really good opportunity because this, the ticker has been such... Um, a stock in play, right? We, I mean, everybody probably traded it at some point um, recently just because it had this crazy run. This was the big red day um, that everybody talked about. And now um, the news when it came, it was on that specific uh, day right over here, technically this, uh, this after hour of that day. Right. So what was special about this opportunity is the time that it took for the stock to actually break out. Normally on a breaking news like this, on a stock that's really in play like that, you know, the fact that it gets added to the S&P is a big deal. That means the S&P is going to have to buy some stocks. So automatically, uh, first, it's going to be a positive catalyst, right? And also, uh, the stock is in place. So a lot of people were shorting this thing with option, like, like all kind of instrument, either the stock, option. Uh, because people thought it was never really going to break out again. Like, you know, after a big red day like this, you think it's going to go sideways for quite a long time. And then you get a catalyst after hour that people are probably just, you know, panicking out or chasing in. And there was a lot of delay on that news. So the news came at 517. By the time it got reposted on Twitter, it was somewhere around 520, which is about that time right over here. And the stock really broke out of that range, like, probably like six, seven minutes later, which is so much, so much, so much time to buy the stock. And you have such a small risk on this. You can risk the probably the reference price, which is 906. You can even risk, you know, 902. And the upside was just the craziest thing I've seen in a long time. And there was probably millions to be made on that trade without having to risk that much money. And I thought it was probably the best opportunity of the week or even the month. Like, it's not something that you had to add so much risk on. Uh, you could have traded the trend on multiple time frame, even if you look at something like a five minute. There was like multiple setup. We have a setup right over here. This is probably a little tougher to get in. But even there, if you wanted just to buy another breakout, there was another leg over here. And after that, um, this was another trade for another day. But what did you think about that opportunity and that trade overall? Is this something that you would trade if this happened again and you're at your screen? What would you consider that as an opportunity? Yeah, no, uh, I completely agree. Uh, I, I think that was an amazing opportunity. I know that, you know, there were a couple of traders at their desk that, you know, definitely caught that trade um, that I know. And it just comes down to being at your desk, right? Uh, I feel like they, the S and P likes to do this Friday at the close thing. Um, you know, I don't really know why there was a little pause at 920. Maybe, maybe that's because that was, I think the intraday high, um, you know, maybe that was a little inflection point. Um, maybe it had something to do with options market makers because anyone who was short calls, for example, 
right? You know, you can, your calls can get executed up, up until 5.30, I believe, right? Um, I think it's about that you can do it um, in the after hour, but not for so long. So it should, it could get a... Yeah, but, but, uh, but it could be 5.30s, right? So there's there, that, that 15 minute pause basically is, you know, bef and, tell, and then options, whatever happens with the options, you know, whoever going through the, all that order flow basically, and, and then it can kind of just trade freely, right? Because maybe maybe some of it was market makers who were, were short calls and, you know, they have to run back run back to their desk. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just speculation. Right. And then they're, and then they're the ones starting to buy the stock, right. Or control, control that order flow because, you know, so they don't blow up basically Monday morning. Um, yeah. What, yeah. So when I, when I was reviewing that trade, the, what I thought could have been is a lot of like, there was a, there's a lot of option being traded on that name. Um, because like so much volatility, people are, are chasing uh, some highs some lows whatever you want to call it. But if ever you short some call and for some reason you can't really get executed or X, Y, Z, you just need to buy the stock at a certain point because it's just, you you, it's, you do that or you're going to blow up. So whatever you have buying power left, you buy it. So I feel like the, the, the dynamic was just, it was just so good. There was just a lot of money, money to be made. And I mean, it's something that I think, um, I mean, it's pretty easy to set alerts for that kind of stuff, but it's just being there in the after hour on a Friday, which is like a luck of the draw. Like who's really there? And sometimes that's when the biggest trade happens, unfortunately. Usually it's earlier um, because I was sitting at my desk on the Fridays that I, I was sitting at my desk at the Friday that like Uber and Lululemon because they were they're recent additions as well. Um, but I want to say that those both, they came out at 415 or 420. So the, the 520, the 515 announcement is just late. I mean, I could be wrong. Um, you know, so please don't troll me on the comments about that. But I want to say that it was just earlier in the, in the, in the, on that Friday afternoon where people were probably still there. You know, and maybe that's why I was just a little delayed as well. People weren't there and they had to rush back or open up their phones or do whatever, you know, whatever they had to do. Um, because it was a kind of a quiet Friday and, and to, to, to get involved. Yeah, I think it, it's, um, these are great opportunity. I never traded that many of the add delete, um, whatever the strategy is called, but it's whenever things are getting added to like the spy, the Dow, the cues, and whenever something is leaving, it's like, it's a, it's a pretty good trade. Um, I know a lot of people are going to be looking to short that stock example the day after that it gets like you know they stop buying it for for the ad i don't know if you're familiar with that strategy yeah if you look it's um if yeah. you look at uber's daily chart you know you can there's a massive the day that it gets added you know it gets added at the close um you know, bring up bring up uber and um we can talk about that but yeah i mean just because all of the funds that haven't added their allocation they're going to get in on that print the day the, the day that it closes is there a short opportunity, you know, like that, that volume goes off at the closing print, uh, you know, so 6150, I, you know, I don't know, it, you know, is there a short opportunity that you can, you can short it, um, because now all those funds have added it, but it's still going to track the market. So if the market's going to go back up, then everyone who's long it or they, they have to buy it or the tracking ETFs have to buy it. Um, so it's not going to trade as freely, right? I think that's the key. So people are going to keep trading. People might keep trading SMCI, but um, Tesla, for example, when that was added to the S&P 500, that the way that traded really changed when that was added to the S&P 500, just because so many more funds and ETFs had to start tracking it. Um, you know, so that's maybe that's something to consider. But I, I wouldn't say that it's a it's a flat out short. No, I, I wouldn't say that because that just would be too easy. But it's, um, I mean, I, I don't remember who I spoke about that strategy or introduced me, but it was, um, it was like sometimes there's going to be a good, like a very scalpy trade that you can take that has like a very high win rate. But I'm, I'm not, first, I don't think I'll be even looking for that trade. I'm not really interested in, I try to do less of the one minute unless it's a news thing. But, 
I mean, it's, it's a strategy that exists, um, definitely not a popular one on the internet because that's just shorting small cap, but it is a strategy that exists. And, but I think the better trade was really just about this SMCI when it got added. Um, I mean, the way it traded, I mean, it's, it goes back to what we said is, oh, if I was there, I would have just put my whole account in and, you know, I, I would have made so much. But even if you wanted just to trade it like properly with just like very like, you know, risking 1R, 1.5R, whatever you want to risk it, like the way it traded on that news, we had like a really fresh catalyst, a stock that was super in play, um, you know, something that could have so much range and you didn't really have to risk that much. Like you, you technically had such... You had probably five, 10 points of risk for like a few hundred bucks, few hundred points, like a 10 to one risk reward. Like it was just a really good opportunity. And when I, why I could consider this probably the best one of the month is just uh, on the risk perspective that you didn't really have to risk that much. I think that what, that what makes that trade really great. Yeah. And I think the key is that there's a fresh news catalyst, right? It's a positive news catalyst. Right. And, and as people start seeing these more and as you start paying attention to these more, you'll see, you know, just like you said, that Amazon and the Dow, they gap up. Right. So, you know, <clears throat> even if your risk is a little bit more, right, getting more of your account involved, knowing that this is probably the 99 percent, like there's a 1 percent chance that it references and you lose money. Right. As long as you you know, as long as you don't go all in, go, go all in and you actually have a stop loss or you sell, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's like, I would say like asymmetric risk to reward, you know? Yeah. I think the, the exact math on this trade, if you're listening was you needed to get in pretty much at the $920, your risk at the most was 900. So you're risking 20 points and Technically, you were capped on, even if you didn't want to take it overnight, it went to 1,040. So you made 120 points. Um, yeah, 120 points out of a 20 point risk. So it's like a six to one. Yes, yeah, it's still a six to one. So you can still find those great, you know, risk reward setups. Yeah. So that was, um, that was definitely the one, um, for me, I don't know if you have any other opportunity that you thought were better than this one, or you think that pretty much tops it off. I think that was just a, a great, you know, great opportunity. Um, you know, maybe next week we can talk about some of these small caps that, that have been running, um, especially if they continue to run, um, because I think there's some really good lessons there. Um, you know, but it just is, and then we can see if, 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 if we're getting more and more of those, then, then those might top that SMCI. Um, but we'll see, you know, every, every day in the different, every day in the market's different. And, uh, you know, that's why people like ourselves love to participate, right? It's every day's new, it's a challenge. And, you know, sometimes it's about the game for people. Sometimes it's about the competition versus others. And, and, you know, but for me, it's just, it's about making a living and giving myself like the freedom and the time, you know, to do other things that I want to do. All right, so that's going to wrap it up. Thanks, guys, for watching. If you enjoy, like, comment, and subscribe. Also, leave us a comment or a question if you'd like us to cover it. So thanks again. Peace.